Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's panel discussion on the changing landscape, the impact of the 2014 elections, and how to get involved in advocacy. As Mark said, my name is J.C. Scott, and I'm with Avamed's Government Affairs Department. Appreciate you joining us here today. As everybody knows, we're heading into some potentially major midterm elections on November 4th, and the elections have the potential to shift the current political landscape, significantly impacting issues that are important to the medical device industry. Our panel today is going to give you a snapshot of the elections, address some of the current and future policy challenges that are affecting our industry, and most importantly, I think, explain why it's so important that everyone be involved in talking directly to your elected officials and how best to do that. And to start off, I'm just going to remind you up front that one important way you can get involved is to sign up for AdvaMed's life-changing innovation campaign so that you can see, receive regular updates on developments in Washington that matter to our industry. So we have Ryan and Danielle over here to my left, to your right. Please send, see them and other members of our team if you'd like to sign up and join us. Our time on the uh, panel this, more, this afternoon is short, so I'm going to go Great. ahead and introduce the panelists and get right into the conversation. And then if time allows at the end, we'll uh, open it up to Q&A for the audience as well. First up, we have a very special guest, Evan Bai. Many of you know him as the senator and governor from Indiana. We know him as a longtime champion of medical innovation. With his long record of distinguished public service, I'm never quite sure the right title to call him. In fact, we were talking about that just before we came on stage. And I think we're close enough to the state of Indiana that I'm going to call you Governor Bai today, if that's well, okay. Well, uh, that and with uh, the Congress's job approval rating currently being at 12 percent, Governor is definitely the title <laughs> that uh, I would pick. There you go. Governor Bai served as Governor of Indiana from 1989 to 1997 and went on to serve as Senator from the state until 2011. And among the many eff efforts that he worked on on Capitol Hill, Governor Bai led the charge against the medical device tax. And he continues that work today as a partner of McGuire Woods. Very pleased to have you on the panel. Next to Governor Bai, we have Carol Neubauer, Chairman and CEO of B. Braun of America and B. Braun Medical. B. Braun is a manufacturer of devices that are used for pain management, emergency medicine, home infusion therapy, oncology, hematology, and surgery. And I hope I have these numbers right for everyone. They employ 5,500 people in the United States with U.S. headquarters in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Mr. Neubauer is a member of the AdvaMed Board of Directors and currently serves as the chairman of the industry's communications committee. And like Governor Bayon or other panelists, uh, I don't think it's an understatement to say he is also a longtime vocal advocate for repeal of the medical device tax. So thanks for being with us, Carol. Thank you, JC. Next to Mr. Neubauer is Joe DeVivo, also on the AdvaMed board, and president and CEO of Angio Dynamics, based in upstate New York. Angio Dynamics is a diverse medical device company that manufactures products ranging from radio frequency ablation to vascular access products to angiographic products, dialysis and renal therapy, to name a few, that employs 1,300 people around the world. Mr. DeVivo previously served as the chairman of the Industry Communications Committee and was involved in creating and launching our life-changing innovation campaign. Currently serves as chairman of our International Board Committee's Subcommittee on Emerging Markets. Thanks for being here, Joe. Thank you. And then to Joe's left, we have Jack Phillips, a leading member of the AdvaMed DX Board of Directors and president and CEO of Roche Diagnostics located in Indianapolis with 3,000 employees in the state and another 5,000 around the country. Roche is the world's largest biotech company with truly differentiated medicines in oncology, virology, inflammation, metabolism, and CNS. Roche is also the world leader in in vitro diagnostics, tissue-based cancer diagnostics, and a pioneer in diabetes management. All three of our industry panelists are active advocates on behalf of the industry, and all three dedicate their personal time to not only the trade association, but to direct engagement with their members of Congress on key issues impacting the industry grateful for all of your participation today. With that, let's dive right into the conversation. Governor Bai, I'll start with you, if that's all right. And I'm sure that you are, would be able to tell us exactly who's going to win each of the individual races around the country on November 4th. But let's start with a slightly broader question. What are you expecting, generally speaking, on November 4th? What trends are you seeing that inform your expectations on how the elections are going to turn out? And then as a follow-up, I'd welcome your thoughts on how you think the outcome of those elections is going to impact the device industry's legislative agenda, in particular the medical device tax. And we have how long, uh, <laughs> CJ? Uh, well, let me start with the trends and then the elections and then the device tax. So this, is going to, this, this election will favor the Republican Party. The question is how much? And you look at the trends, uh, majority of the American people think the country is not heading in the right direction. 
uh, particularly when you ask about their economic circumstances. A sizable majority feels that their economic circumstances are getting worse rather than better. Uh, the President's approval rating is at 42 percent or thereabouts. Historically, that has meant a bad election for a President's party, particularly in the midterm election of the second uh, term. And finally, when you look at enthusiasm levels, the, the, the turnout in this race will be fairly low. When you look at enthusiasm levels, who just can't wait to go vote, the Republicans have about a 10 to 12 percent advantage in terms of their base just wanting to go out and send the President uh, a message compared to the Democratic base, which is not as enthusiastic as the Republican base. So you add all that together and you look at historic trends, it's going to be a good election for the Republicans. The question is, you know, how much? So in the House, uh, they're going to pick up anywhere from five to ten seats, the way things are trending now, maybe seven, eight, nine seats. That will actually help uh, uh, Speaker Boehner because that will mean that he is not quite as dependent upon the Tea Party faction of his caucus to pass legislation and should enable him to strike uh, compromises that he might like to uh, strike uh, with either the White House or the Senate. Uh, so they'll pick up seats there. By the way, the only thing you need to know about the House of Representatives, it is unlikely that the Democrats will have a majority until at the earliest 2022. Uh, last, in the last election, 1.4 million more Americans voted for Democrats for the House of Representatives than Republicans. 1.4 million more for the Democrats. The Republicans have a 30-seat advantage. That's because of the way the districts are drawn. So that's baked in the cake until the next uh, census, which will be in 2020. So it's going to be tough for the Democrats to make a lot of headway until 2022. So that's the House. The Senate is going to be very close. It could be 50-50. We won't know who's going to control the Senate until Wednesday because Alaska is so late. The results won't be known until very, very late, uh, actually very early in the morning on Wednesday, if then, because it could be very close. And it is not inconceivable. Think about this. It is not inconceivable that the Senate will be 50-49 with a runoff election in Louisiana uh, the first Tuesday in December to determine who has a majority in the United States Senate. That actually is not, a, that is not an unlikely scenario. Uh, so the key races to look at there would be, it's, it's generally considered that the Republicans have a great chance to pick up the open seats in Montana, uh, South Dakota, and West Virginia. So let's, let's put those aside and say that's right. That's a gain of three. They need to pick up six to get a majority. You then look at uh, you know, Louisiana and Arkansas possibly, North Carolina possibly, three other Democrats uh, running in fairly red states. Uh, let me put those aside for uh, a moment. The, the, the races I would urge you to look at would be the following ones. I would urge you to look at Kansas and, as of the last 24 hours, possibly, but I guess I'm still a little skeptical, but possibly Kentucky. The reason for that, there was a poll out just uh, in the last 24 hours uh, showing that the Democratic candidate in Kentucky had a two-point lead over Mitch McConnell, although the previous eight, ten polls showed that McConnell had a very narrow lead. The reason I say start focusing on those two is that if the Republicans are successful in holding those two seats, which in almost any other year in those two states they would surely hold, then all they have to do is pick up one other seat of Colorado, Iowa, and Alaska in order to win uh, the majority, assuming they also have carried uh, Louisiana and Arkansas. So Kansas is kind of strange. The Democratic candidate dropped out. Uh, the Kansas Supreme Court has ruled the Democrats don't have to put on a replacement, so it's, uh, it's uh, Senator uh, Roberts running against um, uh, Greg, Greg Orman, an, in an independent. And the polls right now have the independent ahead. Uh, now the uh, Republicans are beginning to define the independent. There are some things they can attack him on, investments and things like that. But um, what's going on at the state level in Kansas uh, the Tea Party was successful in enacting an agenda there that's rankled more moderate Republicans. That may work against Senator Roberts. So that could be a very close election. If uh, they were to lose Kansas, they don't have to win one of the three states I mentioned, Iowa, Colorado, and uh, Alaska. They need to win two. Uh, and then Kentucky, if I still think, you know, the odds favor Senator McConnell. He's a real survivor. He's one of the, you know, keenest, shrewdest campaigners out there. But if the Republicans were to lose Kentucky, then they need to run the table in those three states I mentioned. So look at those states first. If the Republicans hold both of those states, they've got a lot better chance, a better than 50-50 chance of getting the United States Senate. Iowa, really quickly, that is so close it could go either way. Maybe a tiny advantage for the Republican, but it's really very close. Uh, Colorado, very, very close. 
A lot of that depends on get out the vote effort. When Senator Bennett was running, he's now the head of the DSCC, they had a tremendous get out the vote effort in Colorado. That could affect things there. And the real wild card is Alaska. There are so few voters in Alaska, even a minor turnout uh, advantage one way or the other could tip the results. And two things I would encourage you to look at, you couldn't make some of this stuff up. There are two initiatives on the ballot in Alaska that may favor uh, the, the Democratic candidate. Uh, number one, there's an initiative to legalize marijuana. Ask yourself who's more likely to turn out to vote for that initiative and who they might vote for in the Senate race. There's also an initiative on the ballot to substantially raise the minimum wage. Ask yourself who's likely to come out to vote to substantially raise the minimum wage and who they're likely to vote for in the Senate election. So both of those things uh, could favor uh, Senator Begich, but it remains to be seen. He's a little behind in the most recent polling. So it's a jump ball. I think the most likely outcome is 50-50 or 51-49, one way or the other. Look at those two Republicans, uh, Kansas and Kentucky. The president is very unpopular. They're very Republican states, but the two incumbents' popularity ratings are like 35 or 36 percent. So which is more likely to determine the outcome of those two elections? Barack Obama's unpopularity and the Republican nature of those states or the relative unpopularity of the two incumbents in a sort of an anti-incumbent environment. That's going to really decide who wins the, the Senate. If they can hold them both, I think the Republicans have an excellent chance. If the Republicans do carry the United States Senate, I would think the chances of uh, having a repeal of the medical device tax would be very good. Here's what I would anticipate happening. I think that they will first pass a complete repeal of the Affordable Care Act, probably using what are called reconciliation instructions on, in the United States Senate. The president will veto that. They will then come back and say, okay, we can't repeal it. What changes can we make to it? And they'll look to a number of things involving employer mandates and so forth. But the, the repeal of the medical device tax, both the Speaker and Senator McConnell have said, and Senator Hatch, the head of the Finance Committee in the Senate, have said, this is one of our top priorities. We intend to do this. I know for a fact that the President, in private conversations, has said, look, this is not that big an issue to me. It's just money. And if you can find a way to offset the money someplace else, I don't really care about the policy involved in this. This was not really at the core of the Affordable Care Act. So he's not going to veto uh, this uh, a repeal of the Affordable, uh, the repeal of the medical device tax if you can find an offset for the money. And so the final thing I'd say, and I'm filibustering here, is my guess is, my guess is what you'll see is a replay of what happened between Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich in 1995 on welfare reform. Republicans passed it and the president vetoed it. So the Republicans modified it a little bit. They pass it again. The president says, uh-uh, still goes too far. He and so he vetoed it again. Third time, the Republicans pass it. And uh, the president finally said, okay, you know, you've amended it enough now. This I think I can accept. The key difference there was Bill Clinton had to run for re-election. This president does not. But I would still say there's a better than 50-50 chance of getting this done if the president, uh, if the Senate uh, has a uh, majority of Republicans, because I don't think the president will uh, veto the legislation over just this. So if the president, if the Republicans don't overreach on other things, I think this is doable. Thank you, Governor Biden. Maybe just 60 seconds more to talk about the status quo outcome in the elections. If Republicans don't take over the Senate, what factors, if any, do you see that give you hope, not just on the medical device tax, or broadly speaking, that there's going to be a change in the way they're doing business in the Congress and that they're going to start moving bills that would give opportunities to address some of our issues? Well, it, it will be tough just in general because, as all of you have observed, Congress is just not functioning very well right now. But there may be a window of opportunity for the first six months before the 2016 uh, election cycle gets kicked off, particularly for the presidential candidates who will be appealing to their party bases, and the party bases will be saying, don't compromise, don't compromise on anything. So the window of opportunity would be You'll have a president who's finishing out his term. He may not be able to accomplish the two or three or four things that would be at the top of his agenda, but he's probably going to want to accomplish something. So if you can find a way to get the votes to put something on his desk that is reasonably palatable, he's probably going to want to accomplish something rather than nothing. So that's one thing you have going for you. He may be a little bit more amenable now than in the past. The other thing is the Senate, if the Democrats keep a majority, it's, it, it's not going to be any more than 51-49, probably 50-50. And so when it's 50-50, it's so close that every vote will matter. So if there are two or three or four moderate Democratic champions on an issue like the medical uh, device tax repeal, and they go to Harry Reid and say, Harry, 
you're going to be asking me to vote for, to confirm a lot of judges, and in my state, this is not going to be a very popular thing. You're going to be asking me to vote for this issue and that issue and that issue, and in my state, these aren't very popular things. You've got to give me something to show for this. You've got to give me something I can feel good about in terms of policy, and the medical device tax is it. If you can get two or three or four people to kind of have those conversations with Senator Reid, then that really, given the very close division of the Senate and a desire probably of the President to try and get something done before he leaves uh, in that first six months, gives you a shot of getting something passed. But I think in my judgment, um, you know, clearly you'd have a better chance if the Republicans had a majority, but it's not, you still have a chance if the Democrats um, have a majority because it's going to be so close, but it's, it's harder. Senator Reid won't talk to us. That's a problem. But um, who would lead the Senate if, if I'm sorry, GC, That's I'm not right. moderating now, but uh, something I probably should have looked into before. Harry, Harry won't talk to you? Okay. No. You need to build facilities in Nevada. That's okay. Right. That, uh, uh, we'll I, talk I, I, about I'm, that I'm later. I'll look for that advice. But who, who if 50 50, who heads them in the Senate? Who's the majority, who's the leader in the Senate? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure the Vice President breaks the tie on that one. So, uh, because that's key. That'll they had, a, be very, key, they had right? a very famous case where uh, the Senate was split. Now, did I get this correct? Yeah. I think Ben Nighthorse Campbell was the key vote in terms of who the majority leader was, and then he switched parties. But they didn't have a redo. Okay, so, so, um, not that easy. Uh, they may, the short answer is I don't know. My first two years as governor, my state House of Representatives was split 50-50. We had two speakers and two committee chairmen for every committee in the alternated days. I, I doubt if that would be the, uh, yeah, the speakers, we refer to them as stereo speakers. It was, uh, uh, actually, there's a, there's a plaque on the wall of the Indiana General Assembly commemorating the historic evenly divided legislature because we got a lot more done because nobody was in control and in a position to stop things. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So like shorter answer is I don't know. I don't. I'm not sure the president, the vice president breaks the tie in that one. They okay. may just be, uh, have to negotiate it out. Okay. Well, we'll have to look into but that. So, someone will be Googling out here while we're yeah. speaking. They'll have an answer for us by the time we're done, I'm sure. Ask Siri. Will and, somebody ask Siri for us, yeah. please? And Carol, I, I hate to tell you, but that Q&A is coming out of your time. <laughs> so, so, Carol, Mr. Neubauer, we've been living with the medical device tax now since January 1st of 2013. We've been pushing the boulder up the hill since that time, trying to get it repealed. Can you talk a little bit about the in industry perspective on why, regardless of the outcome of the elections, we need to keep pushing that rock because it's, and the impact that it's having on your company and the industry? Well, there are different aspects where the medical device tax is hurting us. The first one is we don't have funds to invest. That's for factories, that's for R&D, uh, that's for people. Uh, that's the first place where it hits us hard. The second one is it's also driving funds out of this country. People are starting to invest. We heard that before from the venture capital and, and uh, mm -hmm. private equity firms that companies are going outside and investing in medical device companies outside the United States because returns are higher, the tax rate's lower. We have the highest tax, corporate tax rate in the development world, and on top of that, we add for our industry, open parents, why, exclamation mark, question mark, close parents, uh, why this industry, uh, why they pick us, we get d this double whammy uh, in a bad tax situation. Um, one thing that I had, I was just on the, we've heard a lot about the 21st uh, Century Cure Initiative from Chairman Upton and uh, the hearings that they've been holding. I participated in one of those, um, in one of those round table discussions and I had uh, Commissioner Hamburg there. Uh, which we had different discussions. And I also had Dr. Collins from NIH next to me. And Dr. Collins was complaining. He said, if this initiative doesn't stop cutting funds for the NIH, then we are not going to have the funds available uh, for the cures in the 21st century. And that's going to hurt. And that's going to really be a problem. And my response to that was overburdening us with regulatory costs and putting a device tax, an ex excise tax on top of our industry is taking those R&D funds from seven to 8,000 medical device companies. Dr. Collins, what do you and Chairman Upton, what do you think that's going to do to the cures of the 21st century? And I hope that that's placative enough that you understand how severe it is. And I know I'm talking here probably to an audience uh, preaching to the choir, but this tax is hurting us and I do not uh, hesitate to tell that to anybody and make my case 
everywhere I can, Washington and everywhere else, I find an audience who maybe help us changing this ridiculous situation. Car Carol, to follow up on that, you, you have, I think, used just about every tool at your disposal on the medical device tax to carry that message forward. One of the things I've watched with admiration is the way you've engaged your employees in particular in educating them, them about the device tax and other policy matters and then getting them directly engaged. As you look, as you said, at a friendly audience here, what advice would you give from your experience in terms of how you engage the employee base in advocacy activities? Well, first of all, talk to them about it. Communicate your message. Let them know what it's costing you. Let them know what it's taking away on funds and why they're not getting the next budget approved because we just don't have the cash flow to make it happen the way they would like to do it and innovate in the future. Broadband is one thing is where the association helps us uh, greatly is they send out these emails that have a standard letter which the, every employee can change to his or her liking and then they just autom they end, uh, change this letter, they put in their email address, they put in their personal information and it automatically goes to their members in Congress. Uh, that has been proven, our employees have truly appreciated uh, this opportunity uh, to communicate directly and make it easy for them. So one thing is tell them the story and make it easy for them to communicate. Uh, that hasn't gone without criticism. It's not that all Bron employees agree with me on that. They, uh, a lot of, not a lot of them, but a few of them have been critical. Uh, but I can live with that uh, if I think that my mission is the one that I, uh, that I can stand behind. So that's one way. Employee engagement is definitely one thing, and our executives are taking this. I'm not the only Bron executive who's taking this message on the road. Thank you, Mr. Neubauer. Uh, Mr. DeVivo, maybe I'll turn to you next. We've talked a lot about the device tax agenda, but maybe you could share your thoughts on some of the other broad challenges facing the industry. In particular, Mr. Neubauer referenced the regulatory side, but reimbursement as well. What, what are some of the other challenges that we'll be seeking to address post-election? Well, I think there is you know, a general, almost a siege on the ecosystem in our industry. And I, I don't know if it's premeditated. I don't think it is. But when, when I hear comments, uh, and you know, Governor By, I appreciate so much your support uh, for the industry and support for the repeal of the device tax. It is really significant that you understand how much that is hurting our industry. If I was ever so privileged to be behind closed doors when someone was being so flippant about whether they care about it or not, well, I care about it. Um, 22 years ago, that man in the second row gave me an opportunity to join this great industry. Uh, that's the founder of US Surgical. If anyone in this room has ever heard of minimally invasive surgery or surgical stapling, if you're in an industry where you're making money on that today, you need to walk up and thank them. Because the environment at that point in time was a partnership between clinicians and universities and an openness in developing innovation. And I fear that in today's environment, that level of investment and risk-taking and certainty is not going to exist in the future. And I think while there's a lot of very well-intended legislators who are trying to improve patient safety, who are trying to create access, who are trying to create a healthcare system where everyone's treated, there's a lot of wonderful principles there, but there are so many blunt cuts that are affecting what is this medical device industry. Whether it's one of the, one of the most, uh, the hardest things to deal with is the lack of certainty today. You see small companies and they're not investing like they used to in the past. You're not getting VCs to invest because we don't have the certainty in our regulatory system. And it's not that the legislators are having this negative intention, but they're having negative consequences. And I wish they would have that sensitivity, whether it's FDA, whether it's reimbursement. We have to operate today in a global stage. And we're seeing companies with the massive consolidations and changes that we have to play not just within the United States now, we have to play globally and where can we get things done that we need to get done, whether it's clinical trials or whether it's you know, early startups. And the, the thing that drives me crazy is the lack of awareness. And I have to, you know, I look at the room and just what, 10 years ago, you just wouldn't see this participation. And Avamed has created a face for the medical device industry that uh, I'm very proud to be a part of. And, and it's given us a voice to now push back and to start championing and to see the amount of bipartisan support that we have today for the device tax repeal is heartening. And we just have to keep working on it. And we have to keep, keep uh, moving it forward. Uh, we've seen some great work from Wanda Mobius and the group here at Avamed on putting a face. You see all the videos here today. You see all the signage. 
What are we talking about? We're talking about job creation. We're talking about improving patients' lives. We're talking about a great industry that is an, still today a net exporter that we want to preserve. And that messaging in this environment, I think, is what is absolutely necessary. So I commend Avamed. I, we appreciate uh, the support. And we have so many great leaders. But I do fear that the future is not as bright, but I'm going to fight for it to get back to what this man, you know, the environment that, that he was able to create. Thank you, Joe. And you were instrumental, obviously, in launching the Life Changing Innovation Campaign, which is oriented around trying to communicate that value. And I think part of the challenge we've recognized is that different than the era that you described, there's a fundamental lack of understanding of our industry and, and what we provide. Is that the perception that you have as well, that among policymakers today, they just don't understand that value proposition, whether it's to patient outcome or whether it's the economic benefit? I think and, the and how do we improve that? I think the association has made enormous strides. I mean, if you think, if you look at the bipartisan support we're getting today, we are, we are starting to shift the pendulum. Uh, I think my, my reaction at times is to the flippant nature of all these policy decisions that are not truly realizing what it's doing to the industry and to not seeing the amount of jobs that are moving uh, uh, overseas and to also see the lack of early investment. That's America. That's a, that was what founded this country, was taking a risk and making an investment. And now someone's saying that we're not a safe bet or we don't have a finite time to market where I can understand, I can manage my risk, that's, that's unacceptable. But I think the association is turning the tide. I really do. And I think a lot of the efforts of Avamed and a lot of the committees <coughs> are creating the awareness and we are getting the support. And to even understand that the device tax repeal is so close um, you know, and, and so front of mind, I think means that, that we are moving in the right direction. We just have to keep at it. Thank you. Mr. Phillips, maybe I'll turn to you next. We've talked a lot about some of the challenges facing the device industry broadly, which affect all sectors. I think the diagnostics industry in particular has some unique challenges that, that it faces. And as we look at some of the current public health crises that the country is facing, I think it just emphasizes the importance of effective diagnostics. Can you talk a little bit about some of those unique policy challenges that need to be addressed in that sector? Yeah, so um, I guess good afternoon, everyone. And JC, thanks for uh, including me. I think one thing is I'm a bit of an outlier, if you haven't guessed up here, I'm, I represent the IVD diagnostics uh, part of AdvaMed, which is AdvaMed DX, which I sit on the board, and I appreciate being here. Um, we do share some common things on stage here, though, today. First of all, from a device tax standpoint, um, that has a definite impact in, in what we do and an impact in our industry as well. And, and like the two other gentlemen, I mean, it's, it's something that we're very um, interested in seeing repealed. I guess the other thing, too, is I share the state with the great governor from Indiana, uh, the headquarters, if you recognized uh, from JC's comments, we're headquartered. Roche Diagnostics is headquartered in Indianapolis. So um, uh, first, maybe a word on, on advocacy. Uh, my father uh, always told me, Jack, you can uh, make things happen, you can watch things happen, or you can wonder what the hell happened. And um, you know, I, I think as I think of advocacy, I mean, this is, and we, we talk about getting involved and the need to get involved. Uh, frankly, over the past couple decades, diagnostics in general has been an area that's been slow on the uptake on getting involved. And I'm talking over the next, last couple decades. Um, the reality is, is as we go um, about this journey, everyone, everyone needs to be involved. So Carol talked about employees. The other group that we engage a lot are our customers. Um, it's so important for our customers to be, our laboratorians to be um, involved in, in the work too. Um, just a couple comments on, on the, things that we're focused on aside from the device tax, um, I guess the first one is uh, around the relevance of diagnostics. You touched on that a little bit as well. The relevance of diagnostics and, and the importance of diagnostics in healthcare is just misunderstood and not appreciated by the key stakeholders and the policymakers. So, um, you know, our goal has been to do just that, and I think we, we can be proud as an industry of what we've accomplished, thanks in large part to uh, the leadership from AdvaMedDX. Uh, we now have uh, payer reform, reimbursement reform in motion uh, with, uh, with the Medicare reimbursement provisions that have been recently put into PAMA. Um, that has, uh, that at least creates a framework over the next couple years for us to um, move towards more of a 
consistent and a predictable uh, level of re reimbursement for our industry. And I think the, the second big area um, is around lab-developed tests and uh, the regulation of lab-developed tests. And this is an area that the FDA is involved in heavily. Um, it's a sticky area and a hotly topic, uh, hot topic area, but it is directly related to innovation. And the reality is in diagnostics, I mean, the innovation that's happening in diagnostics is, is unparalleled compared to where it's been over the past few decades. Uh, with molecular um, genetic sequencing um, innovation that's happening across the spectrum, it is, it is growing dramatically and there's great opportunity. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to regulate lab developed tests and also um, along with uh, on market tests that we go through the FDA. So there's a lot of work going on there. Uh, the FDA, uh, as you may know, just recently uh, launched draft guidance. Uh, there's a 120-day waiting period where they will be taking comments, and, and then uh, we look through this first part of next year to where, um, you know, that guidance will move forward. And so, again, another area of advocacy where it's so important over these periods uh, that we're very active in, in uh, driving the, the issues. Thank you, and you touched on advocacy, and maybe just to follow up on that point in particular, I know that you've dedicated a lot of your personal time to getting to know your elected officials. You spent time with the governor in Indiana. You're frequently on Capitol Hill interacting directly with policymakers. Talk to us a little bit about that experience, why you find value in it, and why you think that traditional approach is an important one to keep in the advocacy toolbox. Yeah, so I guess, I guess first of all, to my first comments, I mean, as an industry, I mean, I've been in, in diagnostics. This has been my career for 25 years um, in different levels. And, um, you know, this, we have not really been an industry that has engaged um, in, poli in, in the political sector. And over the past, again, five to 10 years, we've realized, gosh, that's got to change. And, and so our, a lot of the discussion that we have now in Washington and with, with the governors is, is really around education, and education around the relevance and the importance of diagnostics in the overall continuum of care. So what, how do we impact the diagnostic tests, the lab tests that we produce, how does that actually impact patient care, patient outcomes, the cost of care? Um, and, and when we get that point, and we make that point, and that point is understood, that's when some of the other issues, the bigger issues like payer reform and lab developed tests and, and even the device tax, they're, they're understood and, and um, the, the idea to get the policymakers around our agenda becomes much easier. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Governor Bayh, maybe just to turn back to you, we've heard a couple of different perspectives on different ways that the industry and the individual companies are interacting with policymakers, trying to make the case both for the value proposition of the industry and advance specific issues like the medical device tax. Putting your hat back on as governor and senator, what worked best from your perspective when industry would try to educate you on particular issues? Was it the visit in DC? Was it the interaction in the state? Was it hearing from the individual employees? Are there other approaches you think we should be thinking about? Well, that's an excellent question. First, let me thank my fellow panelists here today for helping our society meet what I think is one of the major challenges of our time, and that is how do we be competitive in an increasingly difficult and globalized economy? What's our comparative advantage? I personally think it's in the more highly innovative parts of the global economy, and I can't think of a better example of that than uh, the medical device space. So thanks to all three of you, and particularly thanks for the 3,000 employees in, uh, in Indiana. That's, uh, <laughs> we're very grateful for that. Uh, so. Well, look, the Washington visits are important uh, because that's where the members are most of the time, but they see a lot of people in Washington. You know, your schedule is going to be filled with multiple visits every day. My advice would be the optimal setting is a visit in one of your facilities in the state or in the district. And the reason for that is uh, the following. It makes in a, a tangible, visible uh, uh, way the point of the contribution you're making to the economy and jobs, which I just mentioned, which for many members, governors, senators, congressmen, that's a big thing. If they can be seen as helping to deliver jobs or helping to grow companies, that's the mother's milk of politics today. When you look at the public opinion polls, Americans say that their foremost uh, concern is about the growth of the economy, their own economic well-being. 
you get that in a more direct way when it's a, a site visit in the state than you do in Washington where they kind of get it, but it's just numbers on a page and it's kind of kind of theoretical. So if you can get them to visit one of your facilities, that's ideal. Secondly, meet as many of your uh, employees as possible. These are voters. Uh, that's important. Uh, also, invite the press to come. Get a picture in the local newspaper. Uh, the TV stations may show up. That's going to be, uh, that's going to really attract the attention of the member. And the final thing, it's a subsidiary thing. It's not, um, if you're just getting to know someone, then it wouldn't be appropriate. But if it's a member who's been with you on your issues, who you really believe in, who's been kind of stand up person uh, on the things you care about, if you combined a plant visit and a local press availability with a small fundraiser, well, that would be the trifecta. And uh, you'd have a very happy member leaving your facility. I can. Thank you. You want to comment on that? I can only second that. It, it's uh, the state of Pennsylvania, by no surprise, we have bipartisan report for repeal of the device tax. That wasn't from the beginning that way, Governor. It was really talking to both of our senators, to our congresswoman and our congressman, and it turned out that we have complete support. And I must say, there's hardly an office that I've went out or a meeting that I've left with other executives where we weren't able to convince that this tax is ridiculous and it's hurting us. And don't forget, we did have in the Senate a symbolic vo vote 79 calling for repeal, 20 actually only against it, and the House has already passed three bills to repeal the device tax. So the, the, the we, momentum we, is there. We couldn't get 79 votes for Mother Teresa in the United States. And, uh, and this States tax Senate. is making it, so it's going to go, I hope, either way, and I, uh, wherever your predictions may come, I hope that the leadership will let that kind of vote happen. But don't give up, and I, I, I can only support what Jack is saying. Uh, don't complain about the decision if you have not worked on, on shaping the opinion, yeah, no, and that no. is honestly our job, yeah. and, and, and you're a great, great, both great advocates, and you've been outspoken, Governor. I also thank you. I think everybody's oh, thankful for what you're doing for us, and uh, from that perspective, keep on working on it. It's going to go. <laughs> well, well said. We actually have a couple of minutes left here um, on our on our panel, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience to see if there are questions that uh, were stimulated by our conversation this afternoon. And if you do have a question, just let us know who you are as you're asking it. That would be terrific. So anybody, anybody have anything they'd like to ask while we have the uh, esteemed panel here? David. There's a microphone right there, Mr. Okay, Nexon. David Nexon with Advomet. A question for Governor Bai. Uh, if the Republicans take the Senate, are we going to see uh, a replay of uh, 1995? That is to say, will they feel it's their obligation to pass the Ryan budget try and force very, very significant changes in social policy on the president. Well, uh, so you'd like for me to address the budget? Well, I, really what the Republican agenda will be if they win, it, will it be a, an, a, an agenda that's really very sweeping as it was in 1995 when the, uh, they controlled both houses, came and in on kind of a right wing, uh, strong white wing platform? I think you'll see, could everybody hear the, uh, the, the question, uh, if the Republicans gain the Senate, how sweeping will the agenda be? Uh, in terms of really reorienting the priorities in the budget and so forth. I've already, David, indicated, I think, that they'll, one of their first orders of business will be to repeal the Affordable Care Act. That'll get vetoed. And then they'll have a fallback to, okay, what kind of changes can we make here that maybe the president will sign? They'll have to go through a few iterations of that. I think there's a better than 50-50 chance that if they don't overreach, you can get that done. On the budget, I think you'll see a, um, uh, a tug of war within the Republican caucuses between those who think, uh, they know that if they come up with something that's you know, pretty sweeping, they're just going to have a fundamental ideological difference of opinion with the President of the United States. And as long as he can veto it, which he would, it'll be sustained in the United States Senate. So you have to ask yourself, if it's not going anywhere, anywhere substantively, what are you doing? And so you would have a tug of war within the Republican caucuses about what good politics is. Some people argue that offering a clear contrast based upon clear ideological differences is the best way to win an election, to motivate your base and so forth. Um, other people might argue that that would be kind of playing right into the Democrats' hands, and what you want to do is to look for modest ways you can compromise, but if the president is unpopular on his way out, if the public is a little restive and ready for a change, why create some huge ideological battle you may lose and really allow the president and the president's party to kind of uh, shift the focus back onto what they don't like about the Republican Party. For example, changes in Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, 
whatever we can argue about the merits are, politically that's kind of tricky ground for the Republicans uh, in a general election for president when the turnout is a lot larger. So I think you'll see that kind of, um, that kind of debate going on. I think they learned uh, the hard way to not shut down the government. Uh, so I don't think you'll see that. I don't think you'll see a default on the, uh, the debt. Uh, and the more votes the Speaker has in the House, I think the less likely, you, you wouldn't see that coming out of the Senate, but I think the less likely it would be coming out of the uh, uh, House. So I'll just, I'll say the House would be pushing for something sweeping. The Senate would be arguing against it. And because the Senate is going to be at risk of flipping back to the Democrats two years later if you look at the states that are up. So I'll just uh, give you a flat out guess. My guess is that they go smaller rather than bigger because their eye is going to be on the prize of winning the presidency and trying to keep the Senate. And that would argue against a sweeping, ideologically uh, you know, clear message of some kind. That's my best guess for you. Thank you, Governor. We have time for one more question. And others in the crowd? Thank you. We have, we have two. Joe Andrew with Novasite. Uh, if, when, and if and when the tax is repealed, what are your plans to do with the funds that will be there uh, that you're not paying towards that, that tax? Ask me? I sure, think to any of our three industry panelists, yeah. Well, to... we, uh, I decided not to let anybody go. I decided not to cut our R&D budget. We had a multi-million, uh, 30 to $40 million project to build a headquarters and educational center uh, for providers. Uh, we put that on hold. I needed that cash flow goes into our R&D budget. 300 jobs for the next three years that I put on and shoved out in Pennsylvania, those jobs will be back on. Yeah, I think on our side, we paid uh, uh, $4.3 million for our, we were about a $350 million business, but that's about half our profit um, in, uh, in the tax. We, we've held off two major R&D programs. Uh, and there's also a, a bunch of other efforts within our GNA that's constraining our business. Uh, we don't have very large profit margins, um, but there's a lot of investment that we've had to cut, so that would come back. And I think, Kimball, you had maybe our closing question. We can get you the microphone. Kimball Thompson with Bio Utah. Uh, this is a, a, a question for the governor, but, but uh, I'd love to hear thoughts from any of you. And that is, why is this industry inexplicably asked to decide which enemies it, it would like to make by, uh, by suggesting where the offset should come from <clears throat> and uh, um, what would be a good strategy for you know, perhaps saying, well, this is not having the intended effect, the, uh, the, the, the device tax and it, it, it's moving jobs overseas. Um, can we make a, a, a case on the merits and, what, and is it possible that it would be received by the president? So to make sure everyone heard the question, um, and Governor, maybe you can help address this. To discuss the offset dynamics, we're moving repeal of the medical device tax. How do we overcome the question of whether that revenue is replaced and how? Well, uh, we're, in a little bit we're, we're in a little bit better position today on the budget than we were before. The deficits have come down as a percentage of GDP. That's a little illusory because they're expected to go back up starting in another you know, year or two. But the long and short of it is that deficits still are an important issue in Washington, D.C. So anytime you're going to propose something that's going to affect the deficit, most, whether it's more spending or less revenue, you always get a question, okay, uh, what are you going to do about this? Now, that's what you're going to get asked. Realistically, uh, there, there are so many moving parts in the federal budget, and the impact of repealing the medical device tax is really a rounding error in terms of the federal budget. If there's the political will, they'll find the fiscal way. So generally, you get asked this question now by people who really don't want to do it. They're just trying to put up an obstacle that could be overcome. I mean, everything from the savings of winding down the war in Afghanistan to dynamic scoring on other parts of the budget, there are to smoothing on uh, you know, pension accounting. There, there are half a dozen different things you can look at to technically offset the revenue effect of repealing the medical device tax. The question really is whether you've got the political alignment and the will to get it done. If you've got that, they'll find the money. That's the, that's, the, uh, that's the short answer. And so the president would sign it as long as somebody comes up with the money in some way. I don't think he'd veto it over, over uh, this. So that was your first question. The second question is, regarded the merits, did you, you said something about the merits? Not often discussed in Washington, but what, what was your question about that? <laughs> yeah, whether you can argue on the merits. You know, all joking aside, I, you have to start with the merits. 
And I found that uh, when you actually have a chance to have a thoughtful discussion with people about this, that it's a tax on sales, not profits. When you start with that, people go, really? Well, that doesn't sound right. You mean, no matter how profitable you are, you've got to pay, you, that's right. They go, well, gee, that, that seems questionable. And then you, you go into the kind of uh, competitive marketplace it is. I, I think there was a fundamental misunderstanding that the medical device industry was not like the hospitals, not like the health insurers, not like some other industries that might take a haircut on their profit margins, but would make it up on volume. People just essentially didn't understand that dynamic. And so if you have a chance to sit down and say, let me explain to you why, on the merits, the dynamic in this industry is just different than these other ones that you included in this, you really have a chance to get um, adherence to the cause. You wouldn't have had a 79 uh, vote. Some of them might have voted because they'd heard from a constituent and they wanted to placate their constituent. But you're not going to get 79 votes in the Senate uh, you know, unless you got the merits on your side. It's just not going to happen. So th that's the place you've got to start. And uh, in this case, the merits are on our side. And when we ultimately deal with this issue, it's going to be because it is the right thing to do. Governor Bayh, I couldn't have said it better myself, and, and so I won't try. But let me just close by thanking all of you for spending the time on our panel this morning, I think, this afternoon. I think it was a terrific discussion. And again, anyone who's interested in learning more and getting involved, the AdvaMed booth is over there between the 100 and 200. Sign up for the campaign. We'd love to have you involved. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.